Good morning, afternoon, or evening, everyone. Um, one of the topics that we'll be talking about in this week's class is creating study flowcharts to report inclusions, exclusions, and attrition. So what are flowcharts? Well, flowcharts generally have two objectives. The first is that they provide viewers with an overview of the study design. They help us to look at what all the stages of the study are that one might encounter, and where they also report attrition. So they illustrate the number of included versus excluded observations and explain the reasons for exclusion at each stage of the experiment. This conference will now be recorded. Hello everyone. In this week's class, we're going to talk about creating study flowcharts and how you can use them to report inclusion, exclusion, and attrition at each stage of your experiment. So before we get too far into this, I think it's important to start off by talking about what flowcharts are and how they're useful. Study flowcharts have two main objectives. The first objective is that they give you a high level overview of the study design. So they should give you a view of how many groups there were in the study and the different phases of the experiment, whether interventions were used and other key design features. The second reason that we use a flowchart is to report attrition. So we want to illustrate the number of included versus excluded observations at each phase of the experiment and also explain the reason why each of those observations was excluded. This information is important for three reasons. First, it helps readers to understand the study. Again, it gives them a high level visual overview of your study design. Second, it helps them to evaluate the risk of bias. So some exclusions can lead to bias in your experiment, whereas other reasons for exclusion don't have that effect. And it's important to know the difference and how many observations were excluded for reasons that can lead to risk of bias and whether there are differences among study groups. And lastly, um, flowcharts and information about attrition helps us attain a essential information for planning follow-up experiments. So if you're looking at a study someone else has performed, it's really helpful to know how many subjects they lost during follow-up um, or perhaps due to surgical complications or problems with sample processing. Is it 10%, 20%, 50%? These numbers have a big impact on the total number of participants or subjects or samples that you will need to complete your research. And so having that information available is really be helpful. Okay, and this is just a quick reminder following from Renee's lecture on blinding randomization and inclusion and exclusion criteria. It's really important to define your inclusion and exclusion criteria before you start your experiment, and this will help you to avoid the temptation to p-hack later. So if you have clearly defined inclusion and exclusion criteria, then you are less likely to end up excluding a data point in a biased way because it looks like it could be an outlier and it doesn't necessarily fit with your hypothesis. Here's an example of what a study flowchart might look like. So here you can see that I start off with 45 Sprague Dolly rats and those are randomized into a jam surgery group and then an intervention or a model surgery group. And those animals were then further randomized into placebo and treatment groups. You can also see that several animals were excluded at each phase of the study. So prior to randomization to the SAM or surgical model, three animals were excluded because they did not become pregnant. And then two animals in the model group were excluded due to surgical complications. And then there were also some animals in the model treatment and model placebo groups that were excluded because all fetuses were reabsorbed. Unfortunately, while flowcharts are a very powerful strategy for sharing information about attrition and exclusions, many studies are missing flowcharts. And so this is data from a study that we did looking at papers published in top peripheral vascular disease journals. <clears throat> 
and we found that only one in five articles included a flowchart, whereas 14% included a study diagram that did not have information about attrition and exclusions on it. Here is another set of data from a larger study illustrating that flowcharts are uncommon in many fields. And so here we used an automated screening tool to look at how often different types of visualizations were used in papers in 23 fields over a 10 year period from 2010 to 2020. And what you can see here, the scales run from 0 to 100. You're looking at small individual graphs for each field, and you can see that in a lot of cases, less than 5 to 10 percent of papers have flowcharts. And even the fields where flowcharts are most commonly used, the prevalences that we see in 2020 are around 25 percent. So what's the difference between a flowchart and a study design diagram? Well, study design diagrams don't report attrition and exclusions. So both a flowchart and a study design diagram provide an overview of the study design. However, only the flowchart is going to give you that information about attrition, the number of in included and excluded observations at each phase of the experiment, and the reasons for exclusion at each phase of the experiment. Why is reporting attrition important? Well, I'll present a scenario here just for you to think about, and we might consider a few more scenarios in class. But let's consider two different scenarios. So in both cases, 15% of patients are lost, but there are some differences. So in scenario one, 15% of patients in the treatment group withdraw because they could not tolerate medication side effects, and analyses only complete include patients who completed the full course of treatment. In contrast, in scenario two, 15% of patients in the entire study, both treatment and placebo groups, withdrew after randomization, but prior to receiving the treatment or placebo fills. These patients could not be reached to schedule appointments, and analyses only include patients who completed the full course of treatment. So I encourage you to just pause the video and spend a moment thinking about these two scenarios. Um, and how knowing this information about reasons for exclusion would affect your assessment of the study's risk of bias in scenario one compared to scenario two. Okay, this is an important paper that I'd like to highlight because it illustrates the biased exclusion of animals or other observations based greatly increases the risk of false positive findings, especially in small sample size studies. And so this is a paper called Where Have All the Rodents Gone? that is published in PLOS Biology. And they look at experimental research in cancer and stroke. And they found that among papers using animal models to study cancer and stroke, seven to eight percent of these studies included animals without explaining why, and two-thirds of papers didn't have enough information to assess whether animals were excluded without an explanation, indicating that in most of these papers we really don't have enough information to assess the risk of bias when it comes to inclusions and exclusions. Here's some other evidence unpublished from our own work, um, and also highlighting that information about excluded animals is frequently missing. So this is research we did looking at animal models of preeclampsia, papers published between 2000 and 2016. And we found that about two thirds of papers didn't clearly specify sample sizes in both the methods and the results, making it impossible to tell whether animals were excluded without explanation. 83% of papers didn't describe their inclusion or exclusion criteria, and 97% did not state whether animals were excluded. So in summary, we need to know three things about excluded observations. When were observations excluded? Why were observations excluded? And how many observations were excluded? So you might be thinking, my excluded observations aren't a source of bias. Do I still need to report them? And again, the answer is yes, because understanding exclusions is important for planning future studies. This information can also help you to improve your studies and your protocols. So knowing when and why observations were excluded can help you identify barriers to participating in studies. 
explore strategies to reduce loss to follow-up or exclusions, and anticipate problems and refine your protocol. This also allows you to create a buffer, so you will know how many extra observations you might need after accounting for attrition and exclusions to ensure that you have enough observations to analyze. So here's two examples. In the first example, researchers in Lab A plan to use a popular animal model to study the effects of a pregnancy complication on fetuses. Authors of papers using this model regularly port, report that animals are excluded if all fetuses are reabsorbed, but barely specify how many animals are excluded for this reason. After implementing the model, researchers in Lab A find <clears throat> that approximately half of animals lose all of their fetuses and the remaining animals have very few surviving fetuses. So in this case, had the researchers known that there were very few fetuses that were surviving this model, then they probably would have invested their resources into pursuing a different animal model where fetuses are more likely um, to survive the, the procedure and be born at the end of pregnancy or be viable at the end of pregnancy. Not having that information means that researchers waste a lot of resources in developing a model only to find out that it actually won't work for the types of studies they want to do. Here's a second example. Researchers obtain omental blood vessels from pregnant women during C-section and vessels are excluded if they're too damaged to respond to vasodilators or vasoconstrictors. Investigators notice that vessels are much less likely to be excluded if they're obtained just, obtained just after the incision is made compared to vessels obtained prior to closing the incision. So here there's some damage to the vessels incurring during the process of cesarean section and that seems to affect how likely the investigators are to get high quality vessels that they can use for their studies, um, which allows them to work with clinical staff to optimize as much as possible the conditions under which samples are collected so that they can use more of the samples that they obtain. Okay, so you might be wondering, can't I report excluded observations in the text? Do I really need a flowchart? We encourage you to use flowcharts because not only do they give your reader an overview of the study design, they encourage more complete reporting. So readers can clearly see the exclusions and the reasons for exclusion at each step, and they can identify the number of observations excluded and why. Um, and then templates that are available allow readers to ensure that all important information about exclusions and attrition are captured, whereas descriptions in the text are often less detailed and lack important information. So you might be thinking, I thought flowcharts were for clinical or human studies. Do I really need them for animal and in vitro research? And the answer is yes, they can be used for all kinds of research because animal and in vitro studies also regularly exclude observations. And just as in human research, understanding how many observations were excluded and why is just important for animal and in vitro studies. So what do we need to consider when designing flowcharts for in vitro study? I have here an example, um, and there are two different types of in vitro studies that you might have. The first is where you start with donor material, so this might include samples obtained from human participants or from animals. In this case, your flowchart should actually start with a donor, so readers should be able to tell how many human participants or animals you attempted to obtain samples of and how many samples were successfully obtained before you proceed with the rest of the in vitro flowchart. The second type of study is that you start from the beginning with only in vitro material from start to finish. So maybe you are using only cell lines for your entire experiment, and these are cell lines that were commercially available and purchased. Here is, I presented an example of an in vitro flowchart created by a colleague of mine, Natasha Drude, here. And here are some tips and strategies. So the first thing that can be helpful is to show a timeline of your experiment on the left hand side. And so here we have clearly labeled days all the way from day one to days 15 to 30 to give a sense of when things are occurring and how long these experiments take. 
The next thing is to specify what n represents at different stages. So often our unit of observation or analysis changes over the course of an in vitro study. It could also happen in an animal study, and we need this to be reflected in our flowchart. So we see on day one, the unit of observation is the number of wells of pluripotent stem cells, whereas by day two, we're, into, we're looking at units of embryoid bodies. And in the later stages of experiments, we are looking at embryoids. The next thing is to state essential details, so things like the cell passage or other details that are important for researchers to understand exactly what you did and would be necessary to reproduce your results. You want to specify the steps and exclusions and reason for exclusions at each phase of the experiment. The next important thing is to add a flowchart to your protocol to provide a quick overview to help readers estimate the resource needs. So if you're sharing protocols online, then you can also include a flowchart along with your protocol, again, to give readers a sense of how many um, samples they might need to start with in order to get the number that they want to analyze at the end. And in vitro experiments often have many different experiments in the same study, so you may need separate flowcharts for different protocols. Some considerations for in vitro studies. The first thing to think about is the source of samples. So if your samples came from patients or animals, then this should be reflected in your flowchart. And you may or may not need to exclude some specimens from patients or animals because the samples weren't of sufficient quantity or quality. You found out after the sample was collected that the patient didn't meet the pre-specified inclusion criteria or test on that specimen failed for reasons unrelated to the samples. So perhaps you had an equipment problem on the day of the, that the sample was collected. It's also important, as we've already discussed, to pre-specify your exclusion criteria, and this helps you avoid the temptation to p-hack and to exclude outliers simply because they don't align with your hypothesis. And lastly, you want to be transparent about the reasons for exclusion. So presenting only experiments that work gives readers a misleading view of your research. Um, experiments generally tend to have excluded observations as well as missing data, and that can happen for many reasons. So readers really need to understand what happened and why, and they need to see all of the experiments and all of the observations, not just the ones that worked. Okay. A quick note of caution here, and I mentioned this on the in vitro flowchart as well, flowchart should clearly identify your experimental unit. And I recommend that people consult this paper called What Exactly is N in Cell Culture and Animal Culture Experiments, which talks about this issue in much more detail. So how do you create a flowchart? Well, reporting guidelines for some types of studies have templates outlining what information is needed. So for example, the randomized controlled trials consort guidelines have a well-known flowchart template. In systematic reviews, there are also templates within the PRISMA 2020 guidelines. For those working in animal studies, there's also an experimental design assistant tool from the NC3Rs. And this can be useful as well in creating flowcharts, as well as planning your study from start to finish. Here's a few examples of flowcharts. So this is from Strobe, um, this is, which is a guideline for observational studies. And it simply shows you the phases that observations went through in the experiment, and then gives detailed information about how many participants were excluded at each phase and why those exclusions were made. This is the template that you might find if you were looking at the consort guidelines, and there are tools for creating um, templates or for creating flowcharts for clinical trials that you can find online as well. Um, you may need to adapt these flowcharts to match your particular study design. And this is the template that's available through the PRISMA guidelines for systematic reviews. And again, there are online tools available here to help you make flowcharts for your systematic review. This simply illustrates um, information about templates for different variations of systematic reviews, depending on where the, the sources came from. And there's also a Shiny app for helping users to make flowcharts.
For animal studies, I mentioned that you can use the experimental design assistant tool. So this is just, this tool is created to help you design your experiment and conduct your experiment from the beginning to the end to help you with things like blinding and randomization, um, planning out your groups, your analysis, and monitoring your inclusions and exclusions throughout the study. It does take a bit of time to learn to use, and the flowcharts that it creates are a little bit different. Um, they're not simply about it reporting attrition. There's a lot of other information here as well, but that is one option for researchers who are conducting animal studies and want to create a flowchart. So you might be wondering, what if my study design doesn't exactly match the template? Well, you can simply modify the template to reflect your design. And so this is the modification of the Prisma flowchart for systematic reviews. Um, and this was modified to include a journal screening phase as well as an article screening phase, and then to show that three different fields were assessed and to give information for each of those fields. Here's another example of a flowchart that was created for an observational cohort study. Um, and again, you can say, see here that the labels on the boxes, the number of boxes, the stages of the experiment can all be reflected in the flowchart. You simply have to adapt your flowchart structure to reflect the design and the groups that you have in your experiment. Some tips for making flowcharts. Okay, the first is to specify the starting number of observations in the first box. So you should have a sample size and you should also state what type of observations those are um, and be as detailed as you can here. So if you're working with animals, maybe give a species and strain. If you're talking about people or human participants, you might want to specify some of the inclusion criteria for the study. You want to explain everything clearly but concisely. So readers should be able to understand the flowchart without reading the paper. Again, it should give them a high level visual overview of your study design. Be specific, so state the species instead of writing animals or give specific reasons um, for exclusions. And then if you're saying that steps were randomized, then specify what type of randomization you used. Avoid abbreviations. So people like to use abbreviations in flowcharts because it keeps the boxes small. However, we have to remember as well that abbreviations make the flowchart harder to understand. So if you are using abbreviations, I would encourage you to limit them to very wide known, widely known abbreviations and explain those abbreviations in the legend. When you have exclusion boxes, you want to put a big excluded label at the top of the box so that people clearly know that those observations were excluded. And the arrow should point away from the observations that are included in the study and towards the exclusion box. So it's clear that those observations are leaving the study. When you're using randomization, use terms like simple randomization, stratified randomization, or blocked randomization to ra label your randomized steps so that readers know what type of randomization you were using. Use one box per group. Um, this is really important for just making the flowchart easy to read and allowing readers to have a quick overview of what groups were analyzed and when and assessed. You want to place information on the flowchart wherever possible, not in the legend. Legends are often located somewhere else on the page and moving the eye back and forth between the legend and the flowchart takes time for the reader. Um, you may have some measurements that were only performed in a subgroup of patients. And if this is the case, then you might want to state that subgroup or name that subgroup and specify the sample size within the box for the main group. You want to make sure all of your numbers add up, so even simple steps should be accounted for and one should be able to follow the numbers to account for every observation that started out in the study and determine how many were excluded and how many completed the, the, the study and were included in the final analysis. And then lastly, you may want to include variables like sex or gender. This information is often missing and putting it in the flowchart makes it easy to find. Okay, um, in the last few slides, I'll talk about some strategies for creating more informative flowcharts. 
So here is a basic example of a flowchart, and in this case, we are missing quite a bit of information. So how can we improve on this flowchart? Well, one way to do this is to combine three elements to provide readers with a more complete overview of your experiment. So you might have a timeline showing what happened when, the flowchart itself showing the groups, the conditions, and attrition or exclusions at each stage of the experiment. And then you might also have a table of excluded observations. So when we make a flowchart, we generally show cases where a participant, an animal, or a specimen in, in an incompleteness is excluded from the experiment. Um, however, we also often have cases where maybe an observation, um, one measurement for that, that that sample didn't work. And so that one measurement is not available, but all the other data for that, uh, that sample are available. Tables can really be helpful here. Um, so for example, instead of explaining an entire rat was excluded, you might explain in a table that renal histology was missing for one rat due to technical problems with sample collection. However, all other measurements were performed in this animal. Okay, so here's an example of how we do this. We'll build it piece by piece. So we'll start with the timeline. So we have prior to conception, mating, gestational day 14, 15, and 19 with some notations about what was performed at each of the gestational days. We then add in our flowchart, which has details about the study groups, the sample size at each phase, and the reasons for exclusion. So this flowchart shows the groups, the conditions, and the exclusions at each stage of the experiment. And then finally, we have a table which shows in exclusions for individual measurements. So for example, perhaps one animal was excluded from the sham surgery and treatment group because there was insufficient sample or two animals were excluded from the sham surgery placebo group because of technical problems obtaining that sample. Okay, and finally, I'll highlight a couple of complex scenarios. So here's the first one. Um, perhaps we have a case where different measurements were performed in pups and placentas, and the number of animals uh, is larger than the number of experimental units. So we have animals from the same litter uh, that are not necessarily independent. How might we handle this in our flowchart? So here we have our timeline, our flowchart, and our table again, and we can see that in the first three stages of the experiment, the first three levels of our flowchart, we have information about um, the mothers and complete animals. But when we get down to this last phase where the measurements are performed, we're looking at both the dams as well as fetuses, and we have information on the number of litters and then the number of fetuses within that litter, and then we have the same information available for placenta with a note that two placentas were selected from each litter. So this gives you an illustration of the way that you can illustrate changes in your number of experimental units um, or differences between biological and technical replicates within your flowchart structure. And here is a second scenario. So perhaps you have studies with multiple experiments. And in this case, you can simply create a different flowchart for each of your experiments. So here we have a timeline and flowchart for experiment one, and then we have the same thing for experiment two. So the reader can quickly get an overview of the fact that there were two experiments done and get a sense of how those two study designs were different and what each one entailed, as well as understanding attrition reporting and exclusions in each of those different experiments. Okay, so that is the end of the session for today. I will post the slides online so that you'll have an opportunity to have a look at some of the example flowcharts in more detail. Our task in next week's class will be to create a flowchart for your study design. And so some of those examples might be helpful to you as you're thinking about how to create your own flowchart. Thanks everyone, and we look forward to seeing you in class this week.